Protecting Americans' health also means fighting infectious diseases. We are coordinating with the Chinese government on the coronavirus outbreak in China. My administration will take all necessary steps to safeguard our citizens from this threat. As the world bears witness tonight, America is a land of heroes. And my fellow Americans, the best is yet to come. There are whole businesses in the United States that have been around for quite some time that their business model depends on high levels of racial and economic segregation. Perhaps one of the reasons we struggle so hard in the U.S. to get beyond it in housing, health care, education, is simply because there's money to be made, billions of dollars to be made by keeping it intact. In the early 20th century in the U.S., you have this unprecedented accumulation of wealth in the hands of people like Andrew Carnegie, John D. Rockefeller. People in the time know. These are people who break up strikes with violence. These are people who are maximizing profit. These are not heroes. This is sort of driving industrial production in the North. But in the South, they are largely still an agricultural society. There's a lot, of, a lot of labor, a lot of hard labor. And usually that labor was primarily done by blacks. They're being exploited. Uh, they're coming from a system of slavery. Slavery has finally ended. All of a sudden, you have no free labor. And they're kind of trying to figure out, how do we make sure that the South stays economically viable? We need people who know enough to do the work that we need done. So we need to train the Negro to have basic rudimentary kinds of skills. In this moment, you have people like Andrew Carnegie, and he said, I have this great option. It's called philanthropy. One of the serious obstacles to the improvement of our race is in discriminating. Northern white captains of industry who all of a sudden want to go all in on educating newly freed rural black people. What they wanted to ensure overwhelmingly is that they had workers. The students are black families living on the ragged edge of survival. They must be taught and shown that their lives can be made better and more meaningful. They decide really, that it has to be a manual arts training, something that is going to keep these folks subservient to white authority, but also keep them in the South. We have to keep them in the agricultural industry because otherwise our economy falls, falls apart. This is a vision um, of what black education could be, and, and it's getting massive amounts of money from Andrew Carnegie himself, uh, from John D. Rockefeller, with the establishment of the GEB in 1903, which is Rockefeller funded. Rockefeller created the General Education Board, which was a organization that created schools for black students. Rockefeller decides me and my friends should do this. Just a group of rich people and their friends go to the United States Congress and are like, hey, we're going to pay for it. It won't cost you anything, but we want to take over who's getting educated in what kinds of ways. And Congress goes, sure. 
One of the things that the General Education Board was telling farmers is abandon whatever you know about farming from generations probably of having been a farmer and listen to us. African-Americans would learn the latest techniques and how to plow and how to milk a cow and how to pick cotton as if they hadn't been doing that for hundreds of years previously. They were big with black women on the scientific method of homemaking. It was very controlling and it, in that regard, it was all about a kind of white upper middle class standard. It's a form of education that in no way will challenge your governance, and your governance is specifically white Anglo-Americans. We've never had a moment where the country has been committed to educating poor kids and black kids in the same ways that we do wealthy white kids. It's always been a series of experiments for people who were poor. Lucrative experiments, experiments that created wealth for businesses. The process of instituting public education in the United States starts off at its core as having been designed by philanthropists and business people and organized around black inferiority. Most philanthropists have intermediate and ultimate outcomes. The intermediate for many of these philanthropists was black education. The ultimate outcome was pacifying, avoiding revolution, avoiding a rise in black consciousness that could challenge peace. Peace for whom? In Springfield, Illinois, troops and onlookers surveyed the results of a riot that broke out on August 14, 1908. When you're looking at the rise of violence in the early 1900s, what you're seeing for the first time is that blacks are entering public life, and they are breaking those Jim Crow customs. Two days of white mobs raging through the city's black district ended with two blacks hanged from a dead tree and 2,000 blacks looking for shelter elsewhere. Whenever you start to see instances in which some people would call a race riot, what they are is essentially either police brutality, which was directed against the black population, or it was white mobs. Lynching was done by members of white civil society. You know, it wasn't exactly something she would hide. It was something which was like, yes, I'm a member of the Klan. The NAACP, which stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, is founded in 1909. And it's founded after a lynching in Springfield, Illinois. It's not because of racial violence that's happening in the South. They are concerned about that, let's be clear. But it's because of a lynching that happens in, in the North. The NAACP it was mostly focused on anti-Black violence. So this was their thing, stop killing us. That is the first civil right, that black people needed to live first before we could actually go after and fight other things. There was this board meeting at the NAACP, and one of the white board members said that, why don't we also focus on education and housing and voting? Um, and one of the black members at the NAACP responded, and this is a quote, all the American Negro wants is a chance to live without a rope around his neck. So the NAACP is focused on this issue of racial violence. They are focused on how do we protect black lives. They are launching letter writing campaigns. They are organizing their citizens. They are doing demonstrations. They genuinely believed that if they could publicize 
the lynchings and the mob violence, that people's hearts and minds will change and it will end. They genuinely believe this, right? And it did shift. I mean, it's, it's not that it didn't do anything. It did shift, but it, lynchings continued, right? And so they realized that they also needed to combine protest and marching in the street with work inside of political institutions. They had a vision and a view of equality that was audacious. But they were funding themselves primarily by uh, $10 here, $5 there. But they were poor. They were poor for a very long time. The NAACP in the 1920s is considered a radical organization. Funders are like, oh, hey, that, hey. We might want to focus on different organizations, but the NAACP is like, nah, we want to focus on black lives, on racial violence. So in the NAACP's campaign, in terms of their trying to pass an anti-lynching bill in Congress, there is a fund commonly referred to as the Garland Fund. Um, and the Garland Fund was a vanguard of left-wing philanthropy What's interesting about the negotiation between the NAACP and the Garland Fund around a grant was, are they giving this money with strings attached or not? At the time, the NAACP was mostly focused on physical violence and equal pay, like the economic violence. When the, the Garland Fund comes along, they're kind of like, yeah, but we don't want to focus on those things. Like that whole, that's a, it's a downer. You know, like that's not what we want to focus on, we think, what the key thing should be um, is integration. The Garland Fund believes that there should be perhaps like a new initiative focused on desegregation of education, and we should fund work that is focused on desegregating schools in the South. And the NAACP is the best organization to actually lead this effort. And it's crucial, I think, to also understand Without the Garland Fund's funding, the NAACP was a vulnerable organization. They would have gone under. And that was the moment. Their focus began to shift. And so a sense of it being a movement that had to do with the hopes and dreams of Black people and the safety and lives of Black people was supplanted by what you most need is integration. And you need educational integration. The culmination of this education desegregation litigation master plan is going to be Brown v. Board, decided unanimously by the Supreme Court in 1954. It ended Jim Crow in the area of education. Segregated schools were unconstitutional. You don't get the Supreme Court decision without this crusade around lynching and around mob violence and that happens at the beginning of the 20th century. The Garland Fund is reflecting these foundations focus on education at the time. Not, let me see why this violence is happening so I can make uh, a more peaceful and equitable world specifically at any cost to white people. That's always a question. Are you willing to support and hear the outrage and address it at all costs? Because it's going to be disruptive. sector to protect the American people. This is the most aggressive and comprehensive effort to confront a foreign virus in modern history. We are at a critical time in the fight against the virus. I will never hesitate to take any necessary steps to protect the lives, health, and safety of the American people. I will always put the well-being of America first. We will heal the sick, care for those in need, help our fellow citizens and emerge from this challenge stronger and more unified than ever before. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you.
even after the Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board in 1954, it's not that black people were safe. One of the biggest examples of where you see that is going to be the murder or the lynching of Emmett Till. Emmett Till was a 14-year-old young man from Chicago whose mother had moved to Chicago but still had family and people in Mississippi. He goes down to Mississippi, summertime, you know, sort of um, you know, sees relatives. But he goes to the store, and Carolyn Bryant is a, a white woman who's working there. And he whistled at her, most likely just trying to impress his cousins, who are like, you know, this is, this is not Chicago. I mean, this, is, this is a dangerous, dangerous place. But the story that she made up um, was that he had tried to kiss her and that he had been bragging about having white girlfriends up in Chicago and um, that she was in fear for her life as he touched her. What Carolyn Bryan does is she gets her husband and her brother-in-law and they go to Emmett Till's house where he's staying, where his grandfather, and his grandfather hands him over because he understands the danger which everybody is in. They mutilate him. They kill him and submerge his body. And when it's found, it's so distended. He's so bloated from having been in the water. It is not recognizable as a human face. But yet, Carolyn Bryant, her husband, her brother-in-law, they're found innocent. They're just basically, they got away with it. Undoubtedly, it made black people angry, but it also, it also let white people know we're not gonna let you off the hook for this one. His mother decides to have an open casket um, so that the world can see what these white races did to her baby. into the death of a black man after he was stopped by police in Minneapolis. The attempted arrest was caught on camera, and we need to warn you here that it's very difficult to watch. The video of last night's confrontation shows a white police officer with his knee pinning down the neck of the suspect. And you can clearly hear the man saying, I can't breathe several times before an ambulance arrives. Jeff Pegues is following this story for us. Jeff, what are police doing about this? Ale, good morning. Both of the officers involved in this incident are on paid administrative leave this morning pending the results of the investigation. Police were responding to a report of a... Traditionally in the South, schools have been segregated. So it is not surprising that there was opposition when the Supreme Court ordered schools to integrate. I will not force my people to integrate against their will. Little Rock, Arkansas, and the first phase of the trouble. The white population are determined to prevent colored students from going to the school their own children attend. The incidents of the Little Rock Nine, which are the nine African-American kids who had to be groomed and prepared for the racial violence and the stress that they were going to have to endure. The law of the land agrees integration of white and colored school children, but racial feeling still runs high in the southern states of America. If you look through a lot of the photographs from that period, uh, or their propaganda photographs, they have a picture of a black man next to a white woman, and they said, if black and white kids go to school, we're gonna have the mongrelization of the race. By then, everyone was clear that white people did not want black children in their schools. 
They didn't see this as the Supreme Court has now spoken, let us listen because it is the right thing. What they saw it as is there's some political agenda and now you are coming after my baby. The white citizens had lost their battle. Or had they? Whites were like, we have to find our way to make sure these schools don't get integrated. And they settled upon this idea of privatization. The senior prom at the public high school, now officially integrated. Not far up the road from the public high school, the private Prince Edward Academy holds its prom. What they do all across the South, it's the, the model um, for the privatization of education. More than 99% of the white children of the county attend private school. So if we can bankrupt the public education system and take it and just sort of educate our kids, white kids, over here, let's do that. So you had the White Citizens Council and the Ku Klux Klan, white supremacist organizations in the South um, that start a chain of charter schools. They start a chain of privately run, taxpayer supported schools all across the South that enroll tens of thousands of students. They're forming private Protestant schools which are all white. And they're sort of popping up sort of all over. You start having foundations, not the big ones, like not the, not the huge ones, but small family foundations, um, mid-range foundations, start funding this separation in these segregation academies left and right because they see the potential for more of a mass movement around this idea that we can now have access to taxpayer dollars and not have oversight. For a group of philanthropic and business leaders, it becomes a financial opportunity that may not actually have been that grounded in race, but tying it up with, with racism and white supremacy turned it into um, a, a, a bonanza. It fuses the idea of whiteness with this idea of private, where if white is good, then private also is good. What's the opposite of white? Well, then it has to be black. What's the opposite of private? It has to be public. So any type of space, big or small, neighborhoods, buses, bathrooms, schools, become racially integrated, gets devalued, and it gets degraded. There is a move to essentially to withdraw. Whites withdrew from those spaces, and they created private alternatives to those spaces. And then, you know, instead of public golf courses, there's private golf courses. Instead of public pools, there's backyard swimming pools. Instead of going to parks to play in the playground, there's backyard swing sets. Instead of taking the public bus, I take a private car. And then the civil rights movement starts to happen. And that fundamentally, I think, changes the game. What is called the civil rights movement was really insurrection. They demonstrated, they picketed in a drive for equality. We all know what happened to Malcolm. We all know what happened to Malcolm. And so many more. Don't even be afraid to die. No man is free if he fears death. That is the result of the slave rebellion. And we'll keep marching and marching and marching until one day you look around and we'll all be marching together. They needed us for labor and for sport. Now, they can't get rid of us. 
We cannot be exiled. And we cannot be accommodated. Now something's got to give. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 is signed at the White House by President Johnson. President Johnson calls for all Americans to back what he calls a turning point in history. The conventional narrative of the Civil Rights Movement takes us from 1954, Brown v. Board of Education, to 1965, the passage of the Voting Rights Act, and a kind of arc of uh, achievement. But in the mid-60s, you start to see some shifting energy and once legislation has been passed, people start to turn to things like poverty, police brutality, because at the same time as federal legislation in support of civil rights is happening, there's also support of increasing police presence in neighborhoods. There's a very deliberate commitment to law and order that goes alongside civil rights. And white flight has begun from American cities and in part, in response to the desegregation of cities, you get the tax base eroding because white residents move away um, into the suburbs. So you have a kind of powder keg in the United States and that grows um, even more intense after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. The worst race riots since those two years ago in the Watts section of Los Angeles. American cities are essentially, they're on fire. Some of them are actually burning down. Where you find what has been called a race riot, they are always responses to police brutality. Whether it's in Watts, whether it's in Newark, New Jersey, whether it's in Rochester, New York, Cleveland, Ohio, they all start off as essentially because of police brutality. <laughs> The rebellions were kind of organic uprisings that came from deep poverty, that came from experiences of police violence, that came from um, unemployment, that came from the creation of large-scale housing projects in cities where people were literally sitting on top of each other. For many Negroes, housing remains a problem. Well-intentioned white people, well-intentioned liberals, people of political power and influence who are sympathetic to the black freedom struggle. They're like, why, why are these cities burning? A lot of these folks who consider themselves to be liberal, they're trying to separate themselves from conservative white supremacist politics. They believe that there are more genteel ways of actually addressing knotty, thorny issues than some of what they're seeing. They're not saying don't address them. They're kind of like, we can make an argument. We can move the needle. So what happens is that a number of philanthropic institutions are trying to figure out how can they meet this moment, but also how they can stop things from spiraling out of control into a space in which they and perhaps some of their colleagues are uncomfortable. People want a type of change that they can manage. They are not okay with the complete transformation of institutions in which they have actually benefited from. What makes them move, it's a fear of black consciousness. We are now on day seven of civil unrest in America. You're looking live once again as protests get underway to honor the memory of George Floyd. But it comes after more exploitation of the situation last night. Riots, looting taking place on American streets, rocking cities like New York and St. Louis. And President Trump is under fire for threatening to deploy the military on rioters, as well as using extreme tactics to disperse White House protesters just moments before walking to a photo op at a nearby church. Top Democrats accusing the president of fanning the flames of discord. Right now. Right now. Right now. 
those who join this coalition, this movement, are doing so out of their concern to fight against racism, to fight against repression. And politically, we may be active. One of us as a revolutionary, another one as a, as a reformer. What you see with, with the foundations as well as like just rank and file senators with someone like Lyndon Johnson is that they realized that they weren't going to be able to stop the civil rights movement. You know, the Nation of Islam petrified them. The Black Panther Party petrified whites in Northern California because they weren't doing anything illegal. It was legal to carry a gun. We're making a revolution by educating the people to the fact that they should arm themselves for self-defense, you see? Educate them to what the power structure is doing to them, that they've made uh, racism the primary objective that the people have to deal with when we mainly have to deal with capitalism. So they saw like what perhaps real revolution could look like. And for them, it was like, well, you know, something we better start giving some legislation here. And we better start supporting that. Ford Foundation is really interesting in this moment. They become active in terms of this question about reform or transformation. They're like, well, tra transformation's a lot. We just came out of a civil rights movement. Let's focus on reform. And from their positions of privilege, of distance, um, they believed that their money, their connections, their influence could fix it. Um, if they tried hard, if they spent enough money, if they got the right people, if they found the silver bullet, um, they could make this go away. Early on, the Ford Foundation is very much a regional organization in Michigan. And after the Second World War, with the ballooning endowment, it not only creates a national presence, but it's bigger than Carnegie and Rockefeller. For the Ford Foundation and their money, of focusing on the black power, but in focusing on how to contain it. We can meet black power, not in terms of the full transformative vision, um, but perhaps we can focus on black arts programs. Perhaps that we can focus on black studies and colleges and universities and, and resourcing those, right? Perhaps we can focus on funding and or supporting quietly and or explicitly a black liberal elite who can be the spokeswomen and men for black people. Ford started to fund fellowships, um, doctoral student fellowships for black studies and women's studies. Ford had a big hand in opening up spaces, particularly for African Americans and women to get into higher education. African Americans are able to start to come into predominantly white institutions in large numbers where they had previously mostly gone to historically black colleges. But when they start to be able to go into predominantly white institutions, the racial conflicts are still very apparent. And it gets manifested in the classrooms, it gets manifested in campus newspapers, but also outside of the university. Now the brothers in here maintain that they will stay here until the university is willing to talk on their terms. So we're gonna let Columbia know that if they don't want to deal with the brothers in here, they're gonna deal with the brothers on the street. <laughs> you can look at a lot of American history as this kind of contest over the moral high ground. And that really burst upon the scene uh, on April 18th, 1969 at Cornell University in upstate New York. It was Parents Week at Cornell Often many parents stay at Straight Hall in the heart of the campus. Some had already moved in and got evicted when black students decided to occupy the hall. At Cornell University, institutional racism was pretty rampant and African American students were particularly incensed by the refusal of the university to give them a black studies program. 
but also the kind of uh, harassment that was taking place in the dormitories. And so from that, these students really try to engage the administration in conversations about what to do, and they're, it's kind of falling on deaf ears. And so, you know, they decide that they're going to take over an administration building. The blacks were demanding the usual things, black studies, amnesty, and such. Their demands were met, and they came out. It was then everyone realized the black students were armed during the occupation. The images that emerged from this event were, were shocking. And one of the images that was widely publicized across the newspapers of the entire country was of students walking out of the hall, African-American students, with, armed with rifles and with, with ammunition bandoliers strapped across their chests and with a list of demands in one hand and the weapon in the other. It is important to understand the context of armed self-defense amongst African Americans was not coming out of thin air, that it was a response to brutality. It was a response to racial violence. What ended the takeover is uh, President Perkins, President Cornell at the time, had said, you know, we'll, we'll start African studies. This was one of the demands. And the faculty on campus were completely irate. This is the first time in their life when they're having to be around women and black people and Latinx people. There were members of the Cornell community who were uh, horrified by this accommodation. Um, and invested in destabilizing the vision of black studies. The Republic is in trouble. I think that there has come the time in America for a new kind of moral leadership, if you will. That it is time that other peoples in America besides white males run for the highest office in this land. That someday blacks will leave this country. That someday women will leave this country. Shirley Chisholm is the first black and the first woman to run seriously for the presidency of the United States. She won't win. That we will have to move beyond the symbolistic attitude of marches and chants and shouts of all power to the people it will mean making our power to the people a reality by repelling the aggression that's being meted out against those that are truly in the defense of freedom and justice in this country. All power to the people. Supporters of the black liberation movements are stepping up the pressure in the campaign to free Angela Davis. It wasn't a question of morality, it wasn't a question of being good or bad, it was simply a question of power. And the weak black people had no power. We had to have some power. The only type of power we could have is black power. Black power. There was this very short period of time in the 70s around community control and who, who is best able to educate black children. So the Black Panther Party had a community school out in, in Oakland that did amazing. All power to the people. All power to the people. Free body. Free body. They had restorative justice. They had yoga. They meditated. And they had a free breakfast and lunch program. They educated kids by ability group and not age. They asked them to question. They had a Socratic method. And a lot of it was just affirming their humanity, affirming their intellect. In privileged white communities, this is not unusual. For poor black people, this was almost a first. We're not saying that the survivor programs are necessarily revolutionary.
but the survival programs are tools and institutions by which we unify our people around. When we implement what we call a people's free food program, we are implementing something that black people and all poor oppressed people have a right to, and that's a right to eat. They were creating an ambulance program. They had the, the free breakfast program. They had eye clinic. They had the sickle cell anemia foundation. They had a number of almost 50 different initiatives. It's like, where is this money coming from? And then when you look, you start to see that Ford is behind some of it. That Ford is trying to redirect the energies of the Panthers and similar groups to get them off of the streets. The Ford Foundation actually helped, uh, you know, fund the, the Black Panthers People's Free Medical Clinic. It started in Oakland, but there's, there, there came in about a dozen of them, and this idea of trying to heal the community from within. And so it's the idea of how do we meet the needs of the people that we're around in those communities that have historically been marginalized. J. Edgar Hoover, who was the director of the FBI, saw that the Panthers' community programs were more dangerous than them carrying guns because folks were starting to turn away from their dependence on the government and look toward the Panthers to come in and solve community problems. Historically, the Black Panther Party, when we think about it, we think about, we think about violence, we think about all the police conflict, and they were onto something that was really important um, that's often been overlooked. Um, and it just speaks to the larger history of, um, you know, exclusion and mistreatment. The Panthers are really concerned with working on health care because they recognize that you have to take care of your mind, body, and spirit. And there has been a lot of neglect with regards to uh, health care in black communities. You know, you know, when we do get health care, it's in the form of, you know, syphilis testing on African-American men. In the year 1972, there was this sort of expose on the front page of all these newspapers nationwide that there was a study, you know, and it take place in Alabama, and it had been going on for 40 years. The U.S. government had been researching the natural history of an infectious disease called syphilis on a group of African-American men. And these men did not know they had syphilis. They were told they had something called bad blood. And they're told that they're being given some kind of treatment for some illness, and it's really vague, but it's designed to study the effects of syphilis. Researchers in this were basically sort of studying that natural history of, of what would happen to people over time if they were infected with syphilis um, from the beginning to the end stage. And the men in the study did not know that there was a treatment available um, that could cure these people. And so we're talking about men, about five, over 500 men, didn't know they had syphilis. It's really just a reflection of this idea that black people are kind of second class, the black body is somehow different or expendable. These are largely uneducated, poor black men um, in the rural South. And in some ways, the world of science is lending credibility to this sort of social hierarchy. There are just stories like this over and over again. But then there's, then there's this larger sort of oral history that individual people have all over the world, all over the country. So the American Medical Association, right, that's the biggest umbrella of, of a group that represents physicians nationwide. It, it was, um, in some ways, an active participant in, uh, in terms of exclusion, racial exclusion of black physicians, um, but also it prevented black people from, you know, state uh, uh, getting the licensure to practice medicine. And so it, you know, it just really speaks to the idea that medicine as an institution was formally and, you know, segregated. 
In 1910, um, there was this report called the, the Flexner Report, and it really transformed American medical education. So it was a product of a, of a, a teacher, instructor, story named Abraham Flexner, and he was supported by the Carnegie Foundation and the, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, basically, the whole point of it was to um, look, take a, a closer look at the American medical education system. It was also, you know, supported by the American Medical Association itself. the Flexner Report. It is the model uh, at the time, in the early 20th century, of the kind of study that's useful to this network of foundations. Why? Because it's a study by someone they trust to provide reliable knowledge, i.e. someone from their own networks who also, not coincidentally, is white providing a survey of different schools and which ones should be funded. So-called intermittent treatment. At the time, there were seven historically being black um, schools uh, that were training black physicians. So, uh, those seven schools, the Flexner Report recommended the, um, the closure of five of those. That closure meant that they were really shutting off um, the education of potential many black doctors. Those black doctors were often the only ones that black patients could see. It's really this idea of like black doctors preventing the spread of infectious disease among the black population to the white population. And the interesting thing about, you know, you have Carnegie and you have um, you know, Rockefeller who heavily involved with this. Rockefeller was known for doing and providing the funding for research behind eugenics. If you already believe that blacks are inferior genetically and you already believe that poor people are lazy and don't want to work, well, that research resonates with you. So elites gravitate towards this, but they also create the infrastructure, the institutional infrastructure to fund this research. They probably saw themselves, as many in that area, as being progressive, right? They're not the ones that are wearing hood, white robes and going out and hunting black people and, and, and lynching them. And so they see themselves as advancing the cause. Uh, and sometimes the good intentions can still have you know, a uh, real uh, tangible downside. They came here for an antibody test to see if they've been touched by the coronavirus, but they wanted the test to come from a trusted source. Trust is a, ma is a major factor because, I mean, we already know from history that black people have been used for guinea pigs, you know, for a lot of things. With the high rates of diabetes, obesity, asthma, and other respiratory conditions among black people, they should have been the first ones to receive medical care. People didn't believe in what they were saying. And that is where I, institutional racism is so much embedded into this pandemic. There are plenty of trust issues to go around. The pandemic is simply showing us the high price we pay for. Tulsa's prosperous Greenwood neighborhood was known as Black Wall Street when armed gangs of whites rampaged through Greenwood, killing and burning. Planes dropped incendiary bombs. In 2020, Tulsa remained segregated with a history of racially discriminatory policing. Why then hold a rally in a state he'll almost certainly carry again? It's a volatile combination. A history of massacre, a bitterly divided nation on edge, and a deadly virus spreading fast, with a president poised to stir up the brew. Has he taken over? No, he hasn't. Speaking up for the students, I mean, he, the students here feel that... Uh, the students here, but they're not all here. Some of them are afraid to come well, because they don't want to oppose Take you because they don't dislike you and they can't. Please. You're not. You're not. Uh, we're not united anymore, Roland. I would like to say first of all that uh, we have no intentions of violence. We are merely um, occupying state property that we, are, we in fact, our parents pay taxes for, and that uh, we shall resist peacefully. Some sit down, some sit down. Some sit down. 
Over the late 1960s and the early 70s, I can't push them out. at universities, really across the United States, from San Francisco State to Yale to Cornell in 1969, student organizers begin insisting on having black studies departments. We want financial aid. We want to be able to study our history. We don't want to be harassed as we are trying to function in these campuses. These protests are starting to scare white America. It produced a lot of anxieties that the university could not be a site of radical transformation. They are in a conscious endeavor to occupy university buildings and to eventually close down some of our colleges and universities. We've waited for administrators to take action against these campus militants, and we've waited and we've waited, and while we've waited, our campuses have been burning. It is still not quite clear who won at Cornell. But the black students and the tactics of armed occupation did not. We've been a silent majority. We are going to be silent no longer. When you have the unrest among the students at Cornell, you have an alumnus named John Olin who took offense at it. And he wanted to spend his fortune, which he had made in the chemical and the arms industry, on creating academic environments that supported his personal ideology. So he gives money to Cornell basically on a yearly basis, and he thinks that, oh, these protests, this, this, this left movement has gone too far. What happens, perhaps, if I fund more conservative ideas? And so what you see is a number of individuals, wealthy individuals on the right, who believe that ideas matter and that ideas change the world, right? And that the Ford Foundation, working with black power, has shifted the way in which the many people understand their place in it and understand things like liberty and justice and equality. Being rich and being <laughs> well-connected, what they do is they start forming foundations that are gonna produce data they're going to produce text, reports, studies that will begin to influence politicians, that they can get their side of the story out. So you have the foundations like Heritage, which is both a think tank and a foundation, and then you have individual family uh, foundations. So this is how you get the Olin and the Bradley and the Scafies and the Smith Richardsons. They become uh, anti-multicultural. They're kind of like, in the Heritage Foundation, they go to a very conservative idea of what education should be, who gets educated, how they're educated. Their idea was that American universities were becoming, by nature, not just liberal, but havens for leftists and scary socialists and all kinds of frightening elements. And so they wanted to take back the institutions of society, especially those that form young people's minds and attitudes. It's this remarkable period in American history where young people are really kind of pushing the envelope in terms of the political imagination. We, the representatives of the national gay community, come to you on an equal basis with every other citizen. They're talking about all kinds of new social arrangements for Black and Latinx people and for women. This favorable decision is a significant victory for the abortion rights movement and for women throughout the United States. All the various revolutions that are taking place are one and the same. How can you talk about the freedom of black people and women are not free? 
we had the civil rights movement and the women's movement and the anti-war movement and the gay rights movement. But then you also have the rise of a kind of conservative backlash. We are for the black people, we are for the white people, but we just don't want each one forced down each other's throat. Do the whites have rights? Any rights? Conservative forces come in that actually narrow the framework for imagining how the society might be transformed. There was a poll that was taken that said that African Americans were pushing too hard for civil rights. And it was like an overwhelming majority of white Americans, like 85%. Tensions ran high, but Boston avoided another dose of widespread havoc that had heralded last year's first busing effort. And this begins to give people like Ronald Reagan in California the mandate to say, those Negroes and these long-haired hippies, we have to root them out. Reagan's popularity is starting to increase threefold among conservative groups. Later, Reagan blasted federal bureaucracy in a speech to Chicago's Executives Club. He called for a transfer of power to state and local governments. And they're saying, ho, oh, wait, we have the next person who could take the movement forward. Thank you very much. What is it that we as Americans really want? We want to worship God in our own way, to lead our own lives, take care of our families, live in our own style, in our own community without hurting anyone or anyone hurting us. For those who've abandoned hope, we'll restore hope and we'll welcome them into a great national crusade to make America great again. Thank you very much. Thank you. So there's resources that Reagan starts to get from these foundations to put together a presidential candidacy committee. And so all of this foundation money starts to pour in to prop up Reagan's presidency. By the time he gets to 1980 to run for president... It is time for a change. It's already pretty much set for him. My fellow countrymen, the President of the United States. Thank you. I'm told that tens of thousands of prayer meetings are being held on this day. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. We are a nation under God. And I believe God intended for us to be free. When Reagan is elected in 1980, it's supposed to be this, this moment of optimism. And a lot of the conservatives, the foundations, the individual financiers and business interests, felt that they could attach themselves to Reagan in this moment. And as it happens, in 1981, the Council for National Policy is founded. One of the founders is Paul Weyrich this ideological architect of the right in the United States. Paul, you're on to lead off the discussion. Thank you, Mr. President. We appreciate it. Paul Weyrich played a role in founding a number of different organizations, including the Heritage Foundation uh, White Wing Think Tank. Pull out the, the facts and fiction. He really wanted to ignite a hyper-conservative counter-revolution. We hope uh, very much that uh, this effect be part of an ongoing Paul Weyrich says it's not enough to just elect people to office. The left and the liberals have taken over the entire culture. Entertainment, 
education, domestic life, everything. We've got to take it back. I want to describe the Council for National Policy as a group that exerts influence, not exerts power. And it's part of a constellation of organizations that work in concert. All of its meetings are secret, almost all. It brought together big donors and political operators and strategists and then gave them a portfolio of organizations to work with all run by prominent members of the Council for National Policy, working in coordination in their work around elections. I don't want everybody to vote. Elections are not won by a majority of people. They never have been from the beginning of our country, and they are not now. It was like, we want this to play out over the next 20, 30, 40 years. And Ronald Reagan becomes their standard bearer. Thank God for a president who agrees in totality with what we morally stand for here. He cuts a deal with the fundamentalists. He has already established his popularity with economic conservatives. And this is a moment when all of these groups say, all right, this is our chance. This is our launching pad. And the Council for National Policy is begun in 1981. Olin comes in and finances the founding of the Federalist Society in 1982. President Reagan's comments are stark testimony to a concern shared by many of us throughout the nation, the obligation of the legal profession and the judiciary to defend the Founding Fathers' vision of a constitutional republic. Hello, I'm Senator Orrin Hatch. I believe that one of the most important tools in this effort is the Federalist Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. The best defense of our liberties is a government of laws, not of men. The Federalist Society is a group that, number one, funds a lot of the campaigns to have judicial nominees appointed. They also play a role in um, grooming um, right-wing legal talent. They'll find promising young people and cycle them through what one writer has described as the right-wing legal terrarium of, you know, fellowships and clerkships and things like that. What they set about to do was organize law students to be politically conservative despite their tendency to be liberal. The dominant intellectual culture in our law schools is exactly what the Federalist students are challenging. Most of the students are liberal, but I believe that their ideas can be changed. They extended their membership on into practicing the legal profession and then on into judgeships and all the way to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court Justice has died. A lot of people are tuning in right now wondering what this means for the Supreme Court, what this means for Capitol Hill and a confirmation process and the election. This is sort of the crown jewel when it comes to what a president can do, and that is to fill a Supreme Court vacancy. It is remarkable how many Trump appointees are, are now on the bench. And when it comes to the Supreme Court, that is the ultimate, and it is a number one goal and has been his whole career. For 10 years, Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina, had fought the federal government's policy, which denied them tax-exempt status because they allegedly practiced discrimination against blacks. Bob Jones University is, in some sense, the flower of the religious right, kind of an evangelical conservatism at its height. They had a policy of not admitting African Americans until 1971, and then even at that point required African American students to be married if they enrolled in the university. In the 1970s, following a string of court cases, the IRS um, started to take another look at the tax-exempt status of some of these segregated schools. 
and asking why are we subsidizing segregation, you know, tax subsidy is like a gift from the government. From now on, Bob Jones University and other private religious schools that discriminate racially will be allowed tax-exempt status. NAACP President Benjamin Hooks said he considers the move another retreat on civil rights by the Reagan administration. This last action, coupled with all the other actions that have been taken, has given real encouragement, real comfort, real aid to any reactionary racist in this country. It would be hard to overestimate the degree of outrage that this provoked in conservatives and leaders of this emerging sort of hyper-conservative counter-revolution called the New Right. These different organizations that believe that if they have to pay more taxes that you are cutting into their liberty. And what they mean by that is they don't want money to go benefit groups that they don't like like black people. One of the ways that the kind of Southern evangelical right wing recast itself once segregation as a formal matter was rejected by the American public was to sort of shift its focus elsewhere. Now that they have realized that they'll lose their tax exempt status, they need something else to be a rallying cry. We love the rhetoric of this president, but in point of fact... Paul Weyrich is looking for an issue that could sort of unite their movement and bring together disparate strands. They sort of went down a list of these different issues, and when they got to abortion, it was almost like a light bulb went off. And they're like, huh, that could work. The issue is gathering momentum. 100,000 marchers stretching half a mile across Washington, representing the biggest demonstration against abortion in America. There's a material consequence to being racist, but there is not a material consequence as of yet to being anti-abortion. There was an agreement made between economic conservatives and elites on the one hand and evangelicals on the other, and a coalescing of these parts of the electorate. Congress is still heavily in favor of the right to choose, and the Supreme Court, which permitted abortions, is still just in favor of that judgment. At the time that Roe versus Wade was passed, most Protestant Republicans supported it. Abortion tended to be seen as a Catholic issue, but it also didn't divide Republicans from Democrats, and it didn't divide the religious from the non-religious. You know what they do in abortion is they simply take the lovely baby from its natural habitat and they rip it out and they throw it away. It was really only over time when the new right decided to make abortion an issue. What we're witnessing is the battle of philosophies. The Protestant fundamentalists didn't just show up out of anywhere, right? They were already there. They were in the segregation academies. They were the ones that were organizing private schools. They were the ones in sort of white churches. Underneath this all is, of course, race and the rejection of the civil rights movement. But the language shifts, the discourse shifts. In the context of the churches, though, there is a quite explicit discussion. It's not on the public stage, but about this anxiety about white babies and white birth and the fear 
of encroachment and being overwhelmed by non-white people. The 50 largest cities of our nation will be predominantly black or brown, and churches don't know what to do. After the 60s and the 70s, the dark ages of the 20th century, there has been a renaissance of commitment to traditional values, family values. Oh, don't kill your baby lady, please don't. Look at this. They use this issue to get people to support the hyper-conservative candidates that the movement favors. It's a form of identity politics, they're voting identity. have made it crystal clear that rushing a Supreme Court nomination is more important than helping and supporting the American people who are suffering from a deadly pandemic and a devastating economic crisis. Judge Barry, in 2006, you signed your name to an advertisement published in the South Bend Tribune. It described Roe v. Wade as, quote, an exercise of raw judicial power and call for putting, quote, an end to the barbaric legacy of Roe v. Wade and expressed opposition to abortion. As the Senate considers filling the seat of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I would suggest that we not pretend that we don't know how this nominee views a woman's right to choose and make her own health care decisions. We can say to the world and pledge to our children, America's best days lie ahead. And you ain't seen nothing yet. A well-educated black has a tremendous advantage over a well-educated white. If I was starting off today, I would love to be a well-educated black because I really believe they do have an actual advantage today. Hey, look at all this money. <laughs> There's always new things going on, and I don't think there'll ever come a time when that, that would be born. Violent drug offenders will commit more than 100,000 crimes on this day alone. What happened to Rodney King is a blot on Los Angeles and on this nation. And unless black men shoulder their load, no one else can help them escape the hard, bleak lives that too many of them still face. I will strive to improve myself, spiritually. For four years, I've worked hard to stand with the police officers of America, and I am profoundly honored that they've decided to stand with me. On the ground, now. We have come through recession and terrorist attack and the uncertainties of war. America is a nation with a mission founded upon the dignity and rights of every man and woman. Every white person in this country knows one thing. They know they would not like to be black here. If they know that, they know everything they need to know. This is the uh, nightmare scenario that many people have been talking about for so many years. The city of New Orleans headed for a direct hit with a very powerful hurricane, borderline category five. Katrina with very strong winds a uh, very potentially devastating situation.
when the levees broke and New Orleans floods, it was primarily black people who were displaced. Black people were found dead, floating because they could not escape. And then in the aftermath, the failure of an appropriate federal response had devastating effects. If people just died right, right here at the convention center. Uh, kids, old people just fought and dying. Like nobody even cared about us. This sent us off and left us to ourselves. No, sir, sir. Had the federal government been here within, say, 30 hours, 36 hours with food, water, we knew this was coming. Then we wouldn't have had so many desperate people here. The president came down and he said, we will do what it takes. We will stay as long as it takes to help citizens rebuild their communities and their lives what the president said. 17 months later, we heard not a single word. When they decide to rebuild New Orleans, they also decide to not bring back their school system. And they are one of the first cities that actually created a completely privatized school system in the United States. The issue with American education is that the people you're always trying something on are the people who can least afford it. And that's always the group um, that philanthropists end up focusing on with their experiments. One um, that comes out of this period that Gates and others fund are charter schools. You had a series of presidents who made it possible for privatized education, like charter schools, to allow them access to taxpayer dollars. If this nation is to continue to be at the global center of innovation, Congress must act decisively. It starts with education. So Bill Gates, in particular, just started coming up with these ideas. He decided that because wealthy kids went to school in small schools, that what poor kids needed were small schools. And teachers and uh, scholars and other people would be saying, that makes no sense, that makes no difference. But when you grow up, around people who are basically the same as you, and if that same as you is wealthy and privileged and never hungry and doors open, you don't actually believe that racism and poverty are, are structural impediments. The Walton Family Foundation, they are the wealthiest family in the country, and they are really much like Betsy DeVos, completely committed to dismantling public education. You have the Betsy DeVos Family Fund. She, before becoming Secretary of Education, was spending billions of dollars herself. You have the Broad Foundation. They spent $100 million trying to get an all-charter-friendly school board so that they, they can then enact whatever they want to enact. Education becomes a business. There's profit to be made from it. They took New Orleans public schools from F on national report cards to D. It was an experiment. It didn't work. And there's generations of kids in the meantime, you know, who've basically been deprived of a functional education. 
but it had overwhelming support on both sides of the aisle. Republicans, Democrats, wealthy people, people with access to power and influence regularly believe that privatizing education is what makes the most sense. Charter schools are taking money away from public education, taking money away from communities that would benefit from better funded public schools. And many times people in these communities don't have much of a choice, but if you're asked, do you want a choice or not, they'll say yes. Well, school officials told U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos 85% of their 650 plus students are currently participating in at home learning. So there's been a big priority put on improving technology. I think this is a, a tremendous example of the need for different kinds of options and experiences for students. DeVos has long been a proponent of school choice and believes in the future the options will continue to expand. Every recent uh, poll that has studied this has uh, only affirmed the fact that parents want and need more choices. The health care bill, bill that we're fighting today gives government control of our lives, undermines our liberty, and it certainly doesn't make any What's kind of working while Obama is in office is this network of foundations and media companies and think tanks. They're all working together. They're giving money to each other. His term comes to an end, and once that happens, they threw their support behind whomever was going to defeat the left. The Council for National Policy were horrified by Obama and the Obama administration for various reasons. And they saw Hillary Clinton as a possible continuation of Obama policies. So in 2016, they really got behind really Ted Cruz more than anyone else. Over the course of the primaries, Cruz had some early victories and then Trump developed momentum. And you know what's going to happen if you don't vote? Our country's going to go to hell, because that's what's happening. That's what's happening. <laughs> he started winning primaries. And this caused a problem for the fundamentalists, many of whom have a very puritanical outlook on the world. And Donald Trump has not lived the life of a Puritan. Big surprise. For many religious right leaders, Trump was not their first choice. But Trump courted this movement. These Never Trumpers had a summit in New York City in June 2016, and they lined up there saying, we could cut a deal with Donald Trump where he can deliver the goods to us in terms of our agenda. And in return, we'll give him our money and our ground game and our strategy, which he lacks. And if all of this comes together, we can prevent Hillary Clinton from becoming president. Yeah, great service. Here is some of what we can accomplish together. Appoint judges, so important. As you know, I put a list together of highly, highly respected judges. And by the way, these judges are all pro-life. Pro-life was, of course, in this case, a code for uh, approving a wide range of policy positions that the right wants. At some of the events, speakers would get up and say, this election is about judges, judges, judges. Donald Trump will nominate conservative justices who will uphold the Constitution, support the rule of law, and rein in out of control federal bureaucrats. Some subsection referred to him as like, kings, like King Cyrus or King David, the imperfect ruler through whom God chose to enact his will. If God allows truth to be said and heard, we will see Donald Trump the next president of this great America. And Trump plays along with that. Our Christian heritage will be cherished, protected, defended like you've never seen before.
January 20th, 2017, will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. President Trump's executive order on immigration has dominated the news cycle. We're going to have a very, very strict ban. This is not, I repeat, not a ban on Muslims. Slate magazine wrote, quote, of course it's a Muslim ban. The president today in Atlanta armed for political battle. Mr. Trump, the first president to address the NRA's annual convention since Ronald Reagan. I will never, ever infringe on the right of the people to keep and bear arms. Never, ever. The president offering a defense for some of the people who descended on Charlottesville. A young woman killed by a neo-Nazi. President Trump refused to pick sides. You also had very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue. President Trump is about to announce one of the most consequential moves a president can make, his next choice to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court. I have selected an individual whose qualities define, really, and I mean closely define, what we're looking for. President Trump has just signed a historic $1.5 trillion tax bill. And by the way, we are cutting regulation at a rate never seen before in the history of our country. Three years ago, we launched the Great American Comeback, and our country is thriving and highly respected again. And my fellow Americans, the best is yet to come. yesterday that they believe it's inevitable that the virus will spread in the United States and it's not a question of if but when. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, I don't think it's inevitable. It probably will. It possibly will. It could be at a very small level or it could be at a larger level. Whatever happens, we're totally prepared. A sign of the times as most residents follow a statewide stay-at-home order. More than half of the 50 U.S. states are now under those orders intended to slow the spread of coronavirus. You saw the higher rates of COVID in African Americans and Latinx populations because of the kind of work that people do because that they have to go to work. People who had to go out when it was really bad and still work in the grocery store and still be a janitor and still drive the bus. There's also the, the poverty issues with regards to people's diets, which is going to impact them having comorbidities like diabetes and lung problems like asthma. And then you, on top of all of that, you have poor schooling, which is going to impact people's ability to get the white collar jobs that would allow you to work remotely. And then there's the healthcare issue, which is just uh, unequal. We also have a problem with racism and the providing of healthcare so that physicians are, are, are less likely to respond appropriately when black people go to hospitals in distress. There were a lot of stories you'd hear about black people going to these place hospitals and getting turned away, right? And they wait till they get sicker, and then you're in a worse situation. So all these things, these things have played out. That mistrust is really gonna be relevant when we were talking about a long history of experimentation that we echoed back to. Racism is in the thick of COVID at every turn.
We begin tonight with one of the biggest nationwide days of protest since the killing of George Floyd in police custody. Thousands taking to the streets, calling for an end to police brutality and systemic racism. There have been more than 700 protests in all 50 states. All are in the name of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others. There's been waves of movements against police violence and police brutality over 100 years in African-American communities. But something happened in particular after George Floyd's killing that seemed to ignite the entire world. I think it was a real return to uh, Emmett Till. There's a repetition to it that feels like a kind of assault. There is almost no way to believe that black humanity is real or black lives matter in what we saw with George Floyd. But the, the, the Maud Aubrey being shot in the back. Breonna Taylor is, is lying in her bed. There has been this litany of names, repetition of cycles of death. Bobby Hutton, 17, April 16, 1968, in Oakland, shot as he surrendered his hands in the air after a 90-minute shootout involving over 48 policemen. Tommy Lewis. Trayvon Martin to Breonna Taylor, right? And literally dozens of names in between. That became the impetus behind Black Lives Matter, responding to police violence and vigilante violence that went without remediation, but then also with larger questions around policing. Even Black Lives Matter is not untouched by these foundations. There is this funding that is still coming from the liberal philanthropy of the left. Right now, there's a lot of funders that are out there saying, we're gonna learn from this history, and no strings attached. There's always strings. Philanthropy, by definition, is intrinsically connected to capitalism. I don't think that the foundations want to get bogged down in trying to fully understand the problems. Because then that would mean not just undoing institutional or individual racism, but civilizational racism. A lot of people are saying in the foundation world, we're in favor of racial equity. I highly doubt that the foundations that are so embedded with private public sector collaboration have the same ultimate outcome vision of what this funding should achieve. At the very core of the American project is racism. And I don't know that the foundations, whether the ones on the left or the right, have the stomach for that. Because political power is more important to them. One of the ways that we can tell the story of the 2020 election is, of course, that black voters thought Biden was the kind of person who would be acceptable to the American public writ large, precisely because there was this sense of urgency about getting Trump out of the White House. There's a long tradition of, in the Democratic Party in particular, of relying upon black voters for success but then a kind of distancing from policies that are seen as being directed towards African-American constituencies. The people of this nation have spoken. They've delivered us a clear victory. We've won with the most votes ever cast on presidential ticket in the history of the nation, 74 million. I'm proud of the campaign we built and ran. 
I'm proud of the coalition we put together, the broadest and most diverse coalition in history. And especially for those moments where this campaign was at its lowest ebb, the African-American community stood up again for me. You've always hit my back, and I'll have yours. The country is not defined by the winner. It's defined by the race. It's not as though with Biden becoming president that the 70 plus million people who voted for Trump have disappeared. We're going to walk down to the Capitol and we're going to cheer on our brave senators and congressmen and women. Donald Trump becomes his own set of myths, that he is uniquely horrific as a figure, that Trump sowed all of this chaos and discord and disaster, but there is an entire infrastructure of foundations, of think tanks that have been working on this agenda for decades. His presidency disrobes something quite ugly, and it's old. It has flourished and proliferated. You can't get that cat back in the bag. It's not just something to be alarmed by. It's something that, if we're invested in the nation itself, right, we actually have to work to transform. We hold the Trump. When you try to slaughter our people and leave them with nothing to lose, you create somebody with nothing to lose. And if I ain't got nothing to lose, what are you going to do to me? We have one thing to lose. That's our children. And we have never done that yet. And there's no reason for us to do it now. We hold the trunk, I said, right? Patience and shuffle the cards. <laughs> <laughs> 